that if you are going through hell, you just keep going. And I don't know about you, but I am hungry for something more than what I have seen. There is something inside of my heart that longs for the eternal power. I did not become a Christian until I was 21 years of age. And when I got saved, God took me firmly by the hand. My husband, John Bevere, is the one who witnessed to me on our first date. He didn't preach about a mild life change. He preached lordship to me. And I needed that because I didn't need a little minor course adjustment. I needed a 180 degree course adjustment. I had a crazy family. I had a grandfather that was part of the Manhattan Project. He was one of the developers of the atom bomb. I came from a generation of serial adulterers and alcoholics, crazy, crazy people. People that didn't know how to do marriage, people that didn't know how to do life, people that were well-educated and illiterate. So when I got saved, I was all in. It was a radical life change. I spent all of that first night looking for the book of Paul because John had said, Paul said this and Paul said that. And I was like, where's the book of Paul? I just had to have a radical life change. I had a little way Bible in my college dormitory. I stood on the spine. I was like, God, I can't find the book of Paul. And it opened up to Corinthians and it said, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold. Not a glance, but to be held. Behold, the old has passed away and all becomes new. God is kind, but he is not soft. In kindness, he takes us firmly by the hand and leads us into a radical life change. They did a study in the United States of America and they determined there was one common denominator on whether people were able to rise above adversity or come under adversity. They found out that it was something called the grit factor. Grit factor is not based on your talents, your education, your ability, your flash or cash, your glamour. None of that is grit factor. It is your ability to stand and remain standing. We need to be both gritty and godly. Not just gritty and not just godly. We need to be both gritty and godly because the earth needs people that are tenacious with love and truth and the word of God because grit actually closes the gap. Gritty people do not camp. Gritty people do not settle. Gritty people say if they don't like the ending, this is not the end of the story. Gritty people understand that it is not about their history. It is about their destiny. And they know that the attacks on their life are not the result of their past. It's about what they might be in the future. So gritty people see attacks as encouragement. I want to grow in grace and grit. I want my life to be evident. I don't want to preach messages. I want to be a message of somebody that used to be this way and is now this way. I don't want to make excuses and just say the grace of God. I want the grace of God to be what changes me to be gritty. If you go against the grain, you get splinters, regardless of what neighborhood you're from, what your parents taught you, what schools you attended. It is not about where you are from. It is about where you are going. It is not about the family you used to belong to. It is about the family you now belong to. You are no longer citizens of a neighborhood. You are citizens of heaven. And we need to move from what our past is and what we've heard because the truth is we all have the word of God and we can press into it and allow it to be transformed. 
It says, but if you embrace the way God does things, there are wonderful payoffs. Again, without regard to where you are from or how you were brought up, I am so thankful for that because I have no righteous lineage. I had nothing to bring to the table. Being a Jew won't give you an automatic stamp of approval. God pays no attention to what others say or what you think about you. He makes up his own mind. I want to let you know there's two things that up your grit factor. One is worship, and the other one is the word. We are smart, we are well-educated, and we are illiterate regarding life. The very base things, the respect, the love, the honor, the faith, the things that should be foundational in our lives is missing because we are not worshiping God for who He is. Oh, there's people that will acknowledge God, but worship means you bow your knee. Worship means you submit to Him as Lord. Worship means that His Word and His ways is the final answer. Worship doesn't mean that we change God into our own image and our own likeness according to the way we feel about things. Worship means He alone is holy. He alone is God. He alone is the Lord most high. That's what worship means. Refusing to worship Him. Refusing to worship. You know, worship is an acknowledgement. And worship is not admiration. Worship is bowing the knee. Worship is when what God says is higher than my opinion. Worship is when I submit to His will and His ways. Worship means it doesn't matter what our government says. It doesn't matter what popular opinion says. Worship is when we understand that we are owned by our God and we submit to His ways and we live His ways. But you will never discover what you are called to do until you know who you are. And you will never know who you are until you know whose you are. And you do not find out who you are in the presence of people. You find out who you are in the presence of God. And the enemy, the enemy is distracting a whole generation from the presence of God. See, there's a lot of people that may have told you who you've been. But when you get in the presence of God, God will tell you who you really are. Really are. And you only get that revelation of who you really are by a reflection of who God really is. When you have a revelation of Christ the Messiah, the Son of the living God, then He begins to reveal you. See, as I pursue God, He reveals me. That's the way it works. And so we need to know who we really are. Do you know that God will call you son and he will call you daughter? Do you know that God, he's more concerned about his relationship with you than what you can do for him? Do you know that? Do you know God doesn't use people? And we are like, oh God, use me. He's like, I'm sorry, that's not who I am. I'm not a user. I don't use my children. God is a healer. He is a transformer. He is a liberator, but he does not use us. He sets us free and through our testimony, we set other people free because we point to his goodness. But we gotta stop acting like God uses people and then discards them. God is not concerned about your ministry as much as he is concerned about you and your family because the greatest platform you will ever stand on is your life. And He is more concerned about who I am in private than who I am in public. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven and a no on earth is a no in heaven. If you don't know when you are and you don't know who you are, you won't know what to ask. You will ask for the wrong things in the wrong season. You have to know that you are a son and a daughter of the Most High God and that you have complete access. So God will take what you see as a problem 
and make it somebody else's answer. Do you know that God will take your most broken places and cause those to be the places that people identify with? People identify with us based off our weaknesses and vulnerabilities, and then we lead them with our strengths. You know, we have everything that we need to live a life that pleases God. Everything, everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been miraculously given to us by getting to know personally and intimately the one who invited us to God. That's Jesus. That is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the best invitation we ever received. We were also given absolutely terrific promises to pass on to you. It doesn't say marginal, minimal. I hope you just make it to the rapture. It says absolutely terrific promises to pass unto you. Your tickets to participation. Participation, not just spectation. Your tickets to participation in the life of God after you turned your back on a world corrupted by lust. So don't lose a minute in building on what you have been given. When you know when you are, when you know who you are, when you have a revelation that even your problems are somebody's answers, then you will understand that you have everything you need. Any gap in your life has been made up with the promises of God. 